Okay, so here we are, top 20 for 2021. Number one, and I'm going to go straight in. I've finally thrown the alarm clock away. Almost. And I say almost because there are a few exceptions I've had this year that I'll, I'll explain here. So I've been facing a battle with my sleep for years. Not because I can't get to or stay asleep, but because I've struggled with accepting I'm someone who needs a lot more sleep. Now, for a decade in starting as a personal trainer in the city and then building RT Fitness, I've used an alarm clock to jolt myself out of bed in the early hours in the morning. And I'd be fine for two, three days before really struggling to get through the days. And ultimately, I'm getting to Friday and completely crashing and spending my weekends mostly sleeping. Now, everything changed in February when I finally admitted to myself that I was burnt to a crisp and I needed a serious break. And I recorded a podcast about this um, probably around April time. And this is when I took nine days off, nine days off of everything, of which seven were totally off the grid. And I slept as much as my body needed. And every night I was sleeping 10 to 12 hours a night with a few naps in the day uh, as well. And it was only then I accepted that I just needed to let my body sleep. Now this took some adjusting to, as I had to change my usual routine of waking up at 5 a.m., brushing my teeth, making a coffee, journaling for like two, three minutes, and then opening my laptop and just cranking away from 5.15. So if you think about that, from morning, so from wake up to opening the laptop was literally 15 minutes. My morning's now a lot more fluid, and I, and I typically don't start work before 8 or 9 a.m., as I usually wake up around 6.45 uh, 7 a.m. I go for a walk with Chani and then I ease myself uh, into it. And what's been interesting, and this hasn't uh, impacted my productivity in a negative way, and if anything, it's better just because my brain's a lot more rested. Now, the urge to fight this is still there every day, um, especially during busy times, because then that's when the guilt of waking up late uh, and starting work later kicks in. Um, and there's been a few times in the year where it's been really busy and I just thought, oh, screw it, the alarm clock's coming back on. So I put the alarm clock back on, set it back to like 5, 5.30. And lo and behold, both times I tried, and this happened on two occasions. One, uh, one it was around October time and one it was uh, start of this month actually in December. Uh, and both times I tried, I got ill within a week. Um, and whilst I'm talking about sleep here, most of this is actually tied up in, in, in guilt which I'll tackle later on in this podcast. But yeah, the big win here was that I finally, for the most part, ditched the alarm clock. I know it's, it's, it's bad for me and I've just got to remember myself, even when things get busy, to just know that there's no point in trying to fight, fight my body. Uh, it's been years and years in the, in, in, the, in the making here and I think I've written about knowing the power of my sleep for a long time, just never actually actioned it. So this year is the first year I've actioned it. Of course, uh, I am in the lucky situation where I don't have young kids, so I'm sure I'll be. Uh, I'm sure that'll be the next battle when that when that uh, when that arrives in uh, in a couple of years. And number two, a sustainable lifestyle solution takes years to dial in. Now, after I last dieted down for a shoot in September 2019, I slowly reversed up from 71 kilos to 80 kilos by February 2020. I then held in the 80 to 83 kilo range for almost 18 months right up till 3rd of June this year, where I dipped below uh, 80 kilos and I've held between 77 kilos and 80 kilos ever since. I started my fitness journey when I was 17 years old as a, as a 58 kilo skinny fat kid with moves in a pot belly. Yet only 12 years later do I feel like I've truly cracked it and forged my ultimate lifestyle solution. This year is probably the first year on record I've had no slips, no food focus, and no loss of control on my body weight. If I've gone up or down, it's been intentional for either strength or aesthetic reasons. And even when I have made that move, it's only been a couple of kilos. That coupled with the fact that despite lots of fluctuations in my daily amounts of steps, my average steps across the year sits around 11,000. And my average training sessions have always been around the four times a week mark. The steps thing's been interesting because I think when you're trying to build the habit, it's really important. You get it in daily and you hit the daily, you try and aim for the daily average. But what I've noticed when I was reviewing my steps for the year is I've actually had a lot of fluctuations in the months. Um, so the months, so the months would be consistent, but within the months, the days would be, you know, <clears throat> Monday could be 6,000, Tuesday could be 13,000. And it just sort of, 
it, it goes up and down quite a bit. But over the course of the month and then over the course of the year, it averages at 11,000, which is which has been really solid for the last two years, actually. So that's been a big win for me um, with my lifestyle solution. And uh, the good news is our, our entire focus at R&T is, is getting people in jaw-dropping shape and then building a sustainable lifestyle solution to stay in shape effortlessly for life. It's taken me 12 years to really crack this. But with all our expertise and ex- experience as a team now, the good news is you can crack it in about two. You don't need to go through the same mistakes that, that I've been through. You don't need to go through the same trial and error that I've been through. You can crack this in two two years and under, uh, really. And we've seen people do it in, in 18, 24 months uh, when they're extremely engaged with the process. <clears throat> and then if they have muscle building ambitions, then obviously that extends it uh, for, for longer. But it can definitely be cracked in in, in a in a two year time frame, so long as you're you're engaged with the process and really uh, keeping your ears open, um, eyes open for uh, the different elements of trial and error that you need to implement into your day to day. Number three, you got to find a way to exercise brutally hard a few times a week. Now at the end of November, we started hosting our live workshops again, which were a massive win. And the biggest takeaway for everyone was the knowledge that there are always a few more reps in the tank than you might think. The event served as a strong reminder that everyone, no matter what the exercise modality, needs to find a way to train brutally hard a few times a week. There's no mental reset that comes even close. And it's why every Friday, I do my best to train with a few of my friends for a trip to the void uh, with the biggest workout of our weeks. It's super simple on paper. But as always, execution is everything. And the workout goes as follows. Two to three sets of glue ham raises to failure. Uh, One set of RDL uh, between four and six reps done in a constant fashion. And one set of RDLs done in a four to six rep range in a paused fashion. Then uh, reverse band hack squats. One set at four to six reps. One set at eight to 12 reps. And then a rest pause set of banded leg presses uh, where I fail between 15 and 20 reps. So the rest pause is you go as many as you can, uh, stop for 30 seconds, as many as you can, stop for 30 seconds, and then as many as you can. You want to fall in that 15 to 20 rep range. And that's it. If I sit and count those sets, we've got uh, between two, four, five, about seven, eight sets, of working sets. If you want to count the banded leg press as three, then you've got maybe nine, 10 sets. That's it. You don't need a lot of volume to train to, to get uh, amazing results, but that only works if you train with with, with sky high intensity. <clears throat> I've always known the power of the power of training, uh, but what I've learned this year, simply because we're back in the live workshops, is everyone's got to find their modality of exercise that allows them to go to that void. Because if they don't, the results you'll get on a physical level. Um, and a mental level and an emotional level just aren't the same as if you just go through the motions. Number four, and definitely switching gears now. Number four, I am Sky, literally. (laughs) And I'll explain why in a second. So during my break earlier this year, I started to ask a simple question, who am I? Now this took my exploration that I've been on in the past 18 months to a deeper level, where I started to ask questions about what was behind the mind chatter that's constantly going on. For the first time in my life, I started to become conscious that I'm conscious. Now, a friend of mine described it best. His analogy was that of a pond with a big piece of wood over it, and that most people go through life not knowing that there's a pond underneath. But when they have a moment of truth where they lift that piece of wood, everything changes. The pond, when you first lift it, is murky and cloudy and you can't see much. So the journey beyond is simply to start clearing the pond to let the light shine through. Now I may have butchered this analogy, but it really hit the nail on the head for me. Now the same friend then gave me another analogy that blew my mind. We are all the sky. The clouds in front of us are our thoughts and mind chattering, but they always pass. The only thing constant is the sky. And yet, We get caught up in the clouds and identify in the clouds and forget that we're the sky. When I remember my name, Akash, means sky, I was sold. The best book I've read on this year, best book I've read this year on this topic is Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. 
I've got a very long way to go on this journey, but just the simple switch of being aware of my awareness has changed the way I live my life. Number five, always be debugging the mind. This awareness has led me to start debugging the mind. I've always been a self-aware and and reflective person, but where I often struggle is getting caught up in ruminations of what if, and I wish I did this better, which then sends me down rabbit holes in my mind that that is nothing else but self-torture. A habit I've tried to work on a lot is catching any of these episodes and bringing myself back in the moment. And I'm always trying to debug my mind now. If I'm fantasizing in the future or ruminating in the past, I'll try and catch it, catch it as soon as I can to remind myself that none of it matters. And it either hasn't happened yet and probably won't in the way you'd have thought of it, or you can't change it. So the only the, the best case uh, solution is to move on. Now this is ultimately the war we're waging on ourselves. We're waging within ourselves every moment of the day, and it's this battle of the mind that is our humanity's biggest struggle. I remember watching a video this year where it showed human species when they first evolved in the human species. The biggest biggest struggle was survival and finding food and just simply being able to live. Once we clocked out to survive, the the biggest struggle became the battle of the mind. And I thought that the video really explained it uh, really nicely. This is a lifelong journey, but one we can all do a bit better each day with a bit of extra awareness. A few months ago, I had some, some real self-doubt about something I was doing. And I was constantly playing that what-if game. So I told a close friend of mine, and he said his mantra for breaking it is from Mike Dooley which says, thoughts become things, choose the good ones. Now, my wife has been telling me about the power of manifestation and bringing thoughts to life for years, but as with everything, sometimes when it lands, it lands. Number six, the power of meditation. This year was the year I finally started meditation. I've been trying for years, but always thought it it just wasn't for me. The reality was, or the reality is, I was scared of the idea of just sitting alone with my thoughts and just watching them go by. I started around April, uh, May time this year after reading about a style Naval Ravikant described as simply doing nothing for 60 minutes with your eyes shut. Now this sounds simple on paper, but I was terrified of the idea of sitting in a chair doing nothing for 60 minutes. But it was exactly what I needed. I started at 60 minutes, but the habit has fallen in the range of 10 to 20 minutes a day. And it's not been perfect every day, but there are a few things I've, I've realized and they are The more I work, the more I need it. The busier I get, the messier the meditation is. If I start skipping meditation, I know I'm burning out. It's weird how that works, right? If I don't meditate, my mind races a lot more in the day. And just on that one, what I've noticed is when I wake up most days, my mind is like straight away, it's it's going. And it can be tempting to think I need to capitalize on this and make the most and capitalize on it and get stuff done. The reality is what I found is if I just get up and go and go for it, so it's an amazing dopamine hit. It's an amazing feeling, but you then sort of end the day where you've not really had any time to just digest and you've not had time to settle the mind or still the mind to actually think. So in that moment of temptation, just go for it. What I'll do is I'll, I'll really force myself into at least five, 10 minutes. And, and from there, then go into the day. And that can help a lot. Uh, the biggest benefits come from being able to detach uh, your thoughts and observe them for what they are. When you go deep, you realize there's a whole new world you've yet to explore. And the last one is meditation is the best way to quote unquote, connect with the source. And this kind of falls back to the question of like, who am I? Or like, what's what's really going on behind the, the layers and the mental models and the frameworks you've created? One of the best ways to do that is through is through meditation and being able to detach from the thoughts and the clouds that are in front of you and to see what's behind. I did a podcast on this earlier in the year that I'd recommend checking out if you're interested. It was uh, the last of a three-part Q&A uh, type um, Episode number 222. Number seven, detachment is hard, 
but guilt is even harder. I grew up in a household that prided itself on hard work and long hours. It wasn't uncommon for my mum to start work at 3-4 in the morning for a few hours before we woke up, then continuing long after we went to bed. Now this sort of behaviour bleeds into your psyche, and is why I thought I needed to do the same with my working hours. Speaking to, my, speaking to some friends in similar positions, the conclusion is the same. Many of our friends are African immigrants who came to this country with nothing, so work to create freedom for their family. But the freedom created in an external material sense isn't always replicated internally. So the generation after become prisoners in their minds with the same immigrant mentality of I've got to make something happen. Now don't get me wrong, this can be a huge strength and tool in our arsenal. But only when it's used as a tool you can pick up and down, not as a default state. I had a conversation with my mum earlier, uh, earlier this year about this and she said, all I want for you is to be happy. And it's funny how, as young children, we can forge expectations, assumptions and traits that we perceive from others, yet for the most part, it's all false. And challenging my assumptions is something I'm working on a lot right now, like the requirement to work excessive hours and the relationship between inputs and outputs. And I'm starting to learn a lot that more input doesn't equal more output, especially in the realm of, of business. You don't it's tempting to think, you know, with the, with the hustle culture that we're in, that the more you do, the more you get out of it. Ironically, it's probably, it's, it's, it's probably the opposite. Now, detachment is hard in order to, you know, move the balance of inputs and, and outputs uh, the, the right way. But the guilt that comes from trying to detach is what I'm finding the most difficult as it's so deeply ingrained that it's going to require a ton of behavior, mindset, and identity rewiring, just like trying to stay in shape for the first time. So it's all linked, uh, and as always, the body transformation journey is is as transferable um, as anything. Number eight, live life more in acceptance. I was, living, I was listening to a podcast with Mo Gordat, uh, who was the previous chief business officer at Google X, and he was describing his equation for happiness being reality minus your expectations. And that when we, tr- when we face an internal struggle, it's simply because there's too big a gap between the two. Now, this sounds super simple, but it's such an actionable way of thinking that you can apply into your life immediately. So if I'm ruminating, fantasizing, or whatever the emotion is, I'll try to re- debug it and catch it by asking myself, is it true? And can I do anything about it? And these answers will make acceptance a lot easier. Again, this is a massive work in progress for you, but these simple tips from Mogulda have gone a long way in helping. Switching gears again, number nine, the gains don't stop when you eat meat. I should have actually said, (laughs) opposite way. Number nine, the gains don't stop when you stop eating meat. I was on my mini moon in Cornwall in August on a four hour hike along the coast when we stopped on a mountain rock to have a bite. And as I was watching the birds fly by and the waves crashing against the rocks, I started to think about my relationship with meat and fish. As you can tell by reading this, I've been doing a lot of questioning and deep thinking um, this year and, and through exploring consciousness. James, just gonna cycle back a bit uh, from as you can tell. As you can tell by listening to this, I've been doing a lot of questioning and deep thinking this year and through exploring consciousness, this was something that was going to come up uh, sooner or later. I told Chani about it and she replied with, you've been talking on and off about this for about 18 months. What's stopping you? I hadn't registered this, I hadn't registered it had been so long and the only thing stopping me really from cutting, cutting my meat consumption down further was convenience and ease of protein. Now on reflection, this was just another assumption because the world's changed a lot and it's never been easier to eat a high protein diet without meat. And a few years ago, I was on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I was eating a kilo of meat a day and I made the decision at the start of 2018 to cut it down to once a day as eating that much meat surely wasn't doing any good for me uh, or, or, or or the world itself. 
something clicked on a mountain rock this year in August and a few days later I had my last steak and I haven't had meat, fish or, or dairy since. I've documented this more in my uh, Road to April Fools article. Uh, if you haven't checked that, go check it out on the blog. And from, well, this this is actually coming out the first week of January. So from now, uh, eggs would have been eggs would have been dropped, and I am now on the road to getting uh, bodybuilding shredded on a vegan diet. And I'm excited for the challenge, but I'm already asking myself what's going to be coming after. Right now, knowing what I know about climate change, ethics, environment, and sustainable farming that's scalable for seven billion people, it's hard to see an alternative to being plant based. Especially because it's been so easy adopting this lifestyle so far, despite traveling, eat, traveling, eating out, and going to events as normal. And in the rare moments, it's been a challenge. I remember something a friend of mine said. To say um, a friend of mine says to himself uh, in these moments, and he says, "Is my convenience more important than the greater cause?" Now it's easy to think one person being more plant-based makes no difference, but global change only happens one person at a time. Our own egos and self-importance can easily put convenience first. But if we have the privilege to live a more sustainable lifestyle and eat less meat, we should definitely take it. Number 10. Observe the masses and do the opposite. I like to think RNT has led the way in the online fitness space over the past five years, especially in the UK. Whether it's been incredible before and afters, creating a unique transformation methodology or advocating a long-term journey, where the masses are all doing the same thing, pushing typical 12-week quick-fix plans and packages, we put a stake in the ground with our 12-month minimums whilst building our own very, very own proprietary technology that I'm ex- excited to continue working on. Building technology has been an interesting journey. It definitely takes longer and costs way more than you think, but it's worth it. And pouring in decades of collective team experience... The next three to six months will be game-changing for our product and service as we continue creating new features in the pipeline and taking on uh, member feedback on our quest for the ultimate platform to transform. Everyone, uh, every, everyone and their dog is now an online coach. Uh, the online fitness industry is still very early in its maturation uh, cycle. So as it ages and develops, it will separate the, the wheat from the chaff. But this year has been super important for us to position ourselves as the go-to premium platform for getting in jaw-dropping shape and building a sustainable lifestyle solution to stay in shape. Leading the way with it, leading the way uh, brings with it plenty of copycats, which whilst at times can make you feel jaded, I see now mostly as a compliment. Number 11, execution is all that matters. Having worked with thousands from all walks of life, from all parts of the world, we know why people succeed and fail in long-term transformation. Outside of being committed, consistent, coachable, and a good communicator, the overriding factor is execution. It's all that matters, ultimately. If you're ready to go all in and engage with a proven process, you're going to get results, period. There's nothing else that matters. And one of the, most, one of the best examples from this year on the R&T journey uh, was Karen's story, who despite being a single mom working a demanding full-time job, Karen's the ultimate executor, she made it happen, she got into incredible shape, um, and I'll still say this to the day, I think her back condition has been some of the best back condition I've seen across men and women. <clears throat> Number 12, rebranding is way more work than I thought. I was telling a mentor of mine about our rebrand plans and timelines, which was due to fall a week for my wedding. He thought I was bonkers, and I thought he was bonkers for thinking that. <laughs> it turns out he was right, though. This year, we rebranded, rebuilt, and relaunched Arnity Fitness, and it was a crazy amount of work, both in thinking and in execution. In the end, we were six weeks later than I'd originally planned, but it was worth the delay, as I don't think Chani would have been too happy if I was walking down the aisle with one eye, with one eye on, on the rebrand project. <clears throat> as, I, as I spoke about in the press release, um, that you you may have listened to in a previous episode. I'm so glad we didn't change the name. That flirtation uh, of changing the name, which began before I took my break, was an instance of being too tired to make a good decision. But I am glad we changed the colours on the logo. The logo, with how simple it is, took us about three months to hatch. I was dreaming about it every night, when in the end, 
it was a simple warm up logo. So if you if you've seen the article, you'd have seen uh, the the change in the in the logo. <coughs> Jane, I just need to clear my throat. <coughs> Number thirteen. Get perfect later, but if it is if it isn't world class, don't do it. A constant source of anxiety for me is perfection. In my mind during the rebrand, for example, everyone was sitting there waiting to read all two hundred plus articles on our website when we relaunched. Of course, this was madness. But it drove me crazy to see mistakes on all articles I'd written or typos on pages that no one was ever going to read. And it's an area I'm trying to work on. And luckily, some of my team hold me to account on this when my perfectionism is getting a little too crazy. That being said, though, the idea of getting perfect layer is an excuse for poor work. And if anything, since our rebrand, I've adopted the mantra of if it isn't world class, don't do it. And this was really uh, highlighted in the recent a video trailer and documentary that we produced. Now the balance lies in understanding which trade-offs are okay and which need to be perfected. And this is something I'm trying to work on a lot more uh, going into 2022. Number 14, mentors and coaches equal clarity and direction. For the past 10 years, I've had mentors and coaches for different parts of my life, mostly fitness and more recently business. But during 2020 and early 2021, I stopped having formalized coaching in my life. I started to buy into the concept of it's all within, it's all there inside of you and you don't need external guidance, learn from your mistakes and build from within. And whilst true and great on paper, a few things can happen. The first thing is you can't see the wood from the trees. The second is you start to believe in your own bullshit. And the third is you lose an objective eye. Now I think there's certain areas of fitness, sorry, certain areas of life like fitness Everyone should be able to learn how to self-coach themselves once they've built a lifestyle solution where they can stay in shape year-round and then use coaching to know how to get to the next level, like an investment phase. In other areas of life, like business, having long-term strategic mentors can be invaluable. But you often don't realise this till after you stop. And I think the best mentors actually come organically and from a range of industries. And this year I've started formalizing more mentorship in the business and it's benefited the team and I tremendously. Number 15, it's not time for the second book. In January, I decided it was time to write my second book. So I started on Christmas Day 2020 and pumped out 25,000 words in the next 15 days as a first draft. I sent it around to a few people, got their feedback and thought to myself, this isn't worth publishing. So I scrapped it. This was all in the lead up to my break. So I wasn't in the best of creative spaces anyway. Later in the day, well, later in the year actually, I hatched a, pl a better plan on how to do this. But I don't think the timing is right right now to pour so much energy and focus into it. So I'll park it for another year. What I decided to do instead was to promote my first book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life, through an almost monthly giveaway competition. And I think this year we've shipped nearly a thousand out a thousand of them out for free to many countries around the world. Number 16, inch, my, inch wide, mile deep. In a world where you can literally do anything you want, having focus is the hardest skill to master. Some of my biggest lessons this year have come from lacking focus on what matters. I started a daily blog on akashvagela.com on January the 1st to improve my writing skills. But focusing creative energy on the blog took my focus away from where I needed it to be, on the business. It also became a burden after I committed to doing it daily, so I scrapped it a few months later despite having a good readership. Instead, I decided if I wanted to improve my writing skills, I'd do it for what would give me the best results and feedback, marketing copy at r and That's when I also learned that my biggest focus in the company should remain within its leadership, strategy and marketing, and letting the team who have better technical knowledge focus on writing to develop our education hub online, which you'd have seen all the incredible articles that have been produced in the, in the final part of the year by, by Ivan. Writing is a skill that has many forms and can be used in multiple ways. I like writing that tells stories and persuades people to take action on improving their lives. 
Number 17. Getting married really was the best day of our lives so far. Getting married to Chani this year was undoubtedly the number one highlight of this year. In the build up to it, I really didn't think much of it. As I got closer, I was buzzing. The day itself surpassed all expectations. The reality was way better than I ever imagined. I was in the void all day long, right from 4am when I got out of bed uh, because I couldn't sleep all night, to 3am when the party finished. It was a crazy day that I'll never forget and I recently published a reel on Instagram if you want to see a couple of the highlights of the day. Number 18. You don't need a big fat Indian wedding. I remember the conversation with my dad when I broke the news to him that we were going to have a small wedding. Not even 300 people small, but 80 people small for the civil and 10 people small for the Indian ceremony. He couldn't believe it. He'd had in his mind he'd be able to invite everyone he's known all his life to the wedding. But I was adamant from a while ago that I wanted mine to be small, with or without COVID. Luckily, Chani was on the same page. So when we broke the news, it was tough. I wasn't ever planning on budging, so it's not nice to kill a dream like that. Fast forward to early December this month, uh, last month, my dad is at a big fat Indian wedding for a close friend of his, and he told me after, I'm so glad he didn't do this. It's such a waste of time and money, and no one else, no one is even paying attention to what's happening. My dad is now converted with a biased opinion of his son having the best wedding in history <laughs> and is now telling everyone to do it like we did it. Number 19. No one gives bigger and better hard truths than your wife. I learned from my parents a few years ago on episode 100 of RNT Fitness Radio that the best relationships are the ones that have the best communication. I totally get it now. And now... And now Just go back a bit, James. I totally get it now. And after the relationship you have with yourself, the second most important is the one with your spouse. You've got to keep that line of communication open, honest, and regular. Else everything in your life can fall apart. I say this from knowing plenty of people in relationships that are just not happy. And most of the time when I ask why, it always comes down to the fact they just don't talk, or have any honest conversations. There's no one in your life, or no one in my life, uh, I should say, who will give me better and bigger hard truths than my wife. I often think she knows me better than I know myself, and without fail, she won't hesitate to give me a healthy dose of reality. Many of the struggles this year with rumination, perfection, and focus have been brought to light with her, by her, so it's my ultimate accountability. Number 20. Gratitude for my inner circle. I'm blessed to have an incredible inner circle of family and friends around me. This year I've really focused on going deeper with the relationships I have. As I've learned as we grow older, you tend to lose more friends and just shine a brighter light on the ones who are worth having. This is due to nothing more than the seasons of life, the different paths we take and our varying ambitions and personal growth. With more growth, you naturally distance yourself from some and attract yourself towards others. It's just a circle of life playing its way out. So what's next for 2022? I've got, from, I've got some very specific business goals to achieve with RNT. We've just hired a business manager and have plans for a few more key recruits to help us scale our impact. I'm super excited to see, how, see the team goes from strength to strength and our new platform help transform more lives, uh, more lives globally. Personally, I want to continue my spiritual exploration within with more time carved out for meditation, unplugged walks and hard training. I will be getting shredded on a vegan diet for the first 13 weeks of the year with potential plans to compete in bodybuilding if the dates align. So stay tuned for the road to April Fools that I'll be documenting on the podcast, on the website and on YouTube. And ultimately 2022 as a closing sentiment is about going an inch wide and a mile deep and being hyper-focused on what matters most in my life. And I'm super pumped for it. Again, massive thank you for all of you who've been on this journey um, on the, on the, over the past four or five years since we started RNT. Uh, it means everything. It's why we keep doing what we're doing to create an impact uh, in the world and, and continue transforming uh, your life for the better every single week. I'm, I'm excited to share 2022 with you. And, and as always, 
uh, if you've enjoyed this episode and, and you feel there's other people that should, that will get value from it, please do share it on with your family and friends. Uh, so hit subscribe and uh, share the love. Thanks so much for listening. And if you haven't checked out the article that goes with it, it's in the show notes below.